thank you so much from the Living Laudato Si Philippines family that you have joined us this evening. So without further ado, let's begin with an opening prayer. A prayer for our earth. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O oh God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth, so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. So here to introduce our speaker for the opening remarks is the Executive Director of Living Laudato Si Philippines, Sir Rodney Calicia. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, clim uh, webinar series and episode number two, Climate Justice, listening to the cries of the earth and the cry of the poor. And uh, we're Living Laudato Si Philippines. Living Laudato Si Philippines uh, started as an interfaith movement initiated by Catholic lay people calling on Philippine financial institutions to divest from coal-related operations and other environmentally destructive activities. And our inspiration, of course, is the latest encyclical, one of the latest encyclicals of Pope Francis, Laudato Si on Care for Our Common Home. And we see a future as a way of life, like Laudato Si uh, principles. We use uh, this as a way of life and uh, sustainability as our future. And we wish to build capacity and foster more partnerships in mainstreaming the principles of the encyclical of love Pope Francis as a framework and tool for sustainable development. And we aim also to influence relevant institutions, especially faith-based organizations to divest from destructive industries and shift towards financing solutions that promote sustainability and social justice. And may I introduce to you the lead convener of Living Laudato Si Philippines. He is the president of the La Salle University, uh, Science Foundation, as well as the president of Philippine Business uh, for Social Progress, the country's largest business-led non-governmental organization. He, is, he also serves as the president of the La Salle University of the La Salle Philippines, the network of La Salle schools in the country. And now he is heading the East Asia uh, community of the De La Salle brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, please welcome Brother Armin Luistro. Good evening, everyone. We gather in peace and hopefully in well-being, especially at this time of COVID-19. I'm not sure what is special about our gathering, given that we cannot physically be connected with each other. But maybe this is also a good time to be connected with things, with people, with values that we don't normally find ourselves being able to connect easily. Our streets are empty, but there are many other things that allow us to see the road ahead. I'm a teacher, our schools are empty. But I figure there are a lot of lessons that we can learn about life and teach others to share to our generation and even to the next. COVID-19 is a time of fear and anxiety. We don't even know what is next, 
when the lockdown will be lifted. We don't even know the value of money, but we know what is most valuable at a time when things seem to be disrupted beyond our imagination. Pope St. John Paul II challenged Christians when he said that we must realize that our responsibility within creation and our duty towards nature and the Creator are an essential part of our faith. I suppose that's exactly what is our challenge during the time of COVID. What we experience as fear and anxiety, what we miss much as part of what we have been used to, what we have been disconnected from, are all part of this new insight and responsibility that allows us to ask ourselves, so where is faith here? Is it just lurking around? Is it something that we just turn to when there is nothing else? Or is it at the very essence of that human experience that we see in ourselves? Friends, together with many of you, connected in an entirely different way than we are used to, we gather from different regions of the world. I am told there are around 140 or maybe more coming together from the Philippines, Europe, religious groups, Africa, Asia, asking ourselves what should we listen to? Should we listen to the cries of the poor? Should we listen to that pain that the earth has been bringing out? Are our ears ready to truly listen this time? I'm grateful for my co-panelists, Brother Tagoy from the Augustinians, our other friends from 350.org, Miss Beatrice. Thank you to um, all of us who have gathered here and asked ourselves, where is climate justice in the time of COVID? I think this is exactly what brings us together in this webinar. Many of the issues that have come to face us, to shake us, and to disrupt our lives are the very issues that the earth crying out to us over these past centuries have been reaching out to many people. But today, into our faces, we are able to see what happens when what we think is normal is disrupted. I was just thinking of, of just one issue that will be discussed tonight. Money. Now I'd say, what, what do we do with money? If in the past, we know that if we have extra money, we invest it because that will help us prepare for the future. I'm sure all of those of us who are familiar with what is happening with the global markets are a tenter hook, hook because we do not know where the markets will go, where our stocks will go. And even if we had hard cash, what can we buy? I suppose part of the soul searching we go through these days are aspects that ask 
that bring us to actually look at things we have taken for granted. And it is my hope that our gathering tonight will be a real eye-opener, ear-opener, so that we could hear the cries of climate justice. People who are poor, the earth crying out to us within the depths of our hearts. When we connect with each other, when it is difficult for the world and the economy to connect with nature, with God's creation, we find ourselves in the middle of COVID-19. And maybe there is grace here. I imagine this is exactly what the disciples of Jesus experienced after the crucifixion, even after the resurrection, when things have been so changed that they do not know how exactly to re-engage with the world. They gathered in the cenacle and waited. They gathered and prayed. They gathered and reflected. Tonight, we do exactly that. As darkness envelops the earth, we also gather virtually. We come as a community and we pray that in this gathering we may hear the cries of climate justice and someone hopefully will pass through the locked doors of our cenacle and allow us to see beyond what we see today. Welcome friends to this gathering of environmentalists and those who believe that there are lessons, lifetime lessons, we will discover if we truly listen to the earth and God's creation. Good evening. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes. Thank you so much, Brother Armin, for bringing us a reflection point for this evening. To listen to each other and to think about where is faith here during this COVID-19 pandemic, but also to think about how do we gather as a community amidst this new norm. So tonight, I will be introducing two more new speakers to this evening's webinar. And I'm very honored to be with a panel with them this evening. And our first panelist is Miss Beatrice Adeline Tulagan. So Ms. Beatrice Tulagan is a climate organizer and writer based in Manila, Philippines. She got her start in the climate movement after being awarded a travel fellowship as the Youth Advocate for Climate Change by the United Nations Development Program in the Philippines to attend the 20th UNFCCC Conference of Parties in Lima, Peru. She was formerly the Philippine Policy Research and Advocacy Director of the Climate Reality Project. She was also an Environmental and Climate Justice Media Fellow for FRIDA, the Young Feminist Fund, and Open Global Rights in 2019. She is concurrently the East Asia Regional Field Organ Organizer for 350.org an international nonprofit aiming to build a global grassroots climate movement that can hold our leaders accountable to the realities of science and the principles of justice. So here is Ms. Tulagan to talk about climate justice and especially in the context of the Philippines. Thank you so much, Wink. Hi, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Right now, um, let me just pull up my slides. So um, again, my name is Beatrice Tolagan. I serve as the East Asia Field Organizer for 350.org, a global climate nonprofit. Um, 350 being the 
um, being 350 parts per million, which is the safe concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, unfortunately, we have long passed that mark. And I think that connects to um, what I want to discuss with you today, um, which is the need to go beyond climate action and to demand climate justice to be able to build the world that we need. So for tonight's discussion, um, by the end of this, I hope that we'll be able to go through three points. Um, the first one is why climate justice? Why not stop at asking for genuine, ambitious, fair climate action from our leaders, our institutions, and our governments? Um, of course, we all want to um, be forward-looking and to ensure the future of the future generations. So why do we have to look into the past and demand for accountability from historical contributors to the climate change problem? Um, the second point that I want to address is what makes climate change specifically a people issue? What makes it a story of you and me? Um, other than, of course, being um, environmental degradation, a biodiversity loss problem, what makes it at its core a gut people issue that affects most vulnerable countries and most vulnerable and marginalized sectors of society? And my third point is um, knowing all that we know now and being privileged enough to be able to access learning opportunities such as this wonderful webinar hosted by Living Laudato Si and many other webinars, um, especially during this time, how exactly do we fight for climate justice? What do we do with all this information and with our passion for saving the environment and to be honest, saving each other? So I'd like to begin with this. Um, at its core, I'm afraid that climate change is deeply a story of injustice. Um, there are many reasons for this, but tonight I'll just go through three. Um, the first one is that it's a story of injustice because those who are least responsible for climate change are the ones experiencing its worst impacts. We know this very well coming from the Philippines, considering that we're one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change, and yet our um, contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions is barely 1%. So um, it's a story of injustice because we did not cause it, and yet we're the ones who are affected by it the most. The second um, point is that those who cost it, which is in this case primarily um, the fossil fuel industry, are anything but held accountable. In fact, until this point and perhaps for the foreseeable future, um, the fossil fuel industry continues to operate, continues to obfuscate climate science, continues to um, instill this culture of um, uncertainty around climate science. and um, you know, convincing, convincing us that they're doing the right thing, they're just providing a service, they're just doing, um, you know, normal business. So um, that's a story of injustice because even though there are multiple studies, there is an otherwise 99% agreement um, among scientists that climate change is anthropogenic and, it, it, and that it can be traced to um, specific companies and a specific industry. Um, until now, nothing is done to hold them accountable. The third is that the roots of climate change and the impacts of climate change exacerbate structural inequalities. And I'll get more into that later. So what is climate injustice? Um, again, there's so many reasons why climate is a story of injustice, but for this presentation, I'll go to three first. The first one is that there was a study um, led by Richard Hebe of the Climate Accountability Institute that found that only 90 state-owned and privately owned companies are responsible for 70% of historical emissions. So that leads me back to my previous point about us not, be, not causing it and yet we're the ones who are most affected and those who caused it did not even um, have not faced the music for any of their wrongdoing. Um, the second point is that um, there is a historical misinformation campaign, again, without anyone held accountable. This is a screenshot from uh, Annex on the Energy Company, August 1988. And their official position at the time is to emphasize the uncertainty in scientific conclusions regarding the potential enhanced greenhouse effect. Um, for most of the 1980s, Exxon was actually a pioneer in climate change research. Um, they sponsored workshops, they founded research, and they did high-tech experiments to explore the science. But by 1990, 
um, it was proven that the company finally took notice of the roots of global warming and they took a different posture. So um, there are now multiple studies and multiple articles confirming that they poured millions into a campaign that questioned climate science. So they also took ads in major newspapers in the United States, such as the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and New York Times, um, convincing all readers that you know climate change science is still not fixed, that people were still making um, new findings about it, and that it's murky and uncertain. Um, this is, of course, to sow doubt among the hearts of, um, of the public and also to delay and even question um, climate action from government. Um, and the third um, point on why climate change is a story of injustice is that despite the best efforts of governments, there are still some actors who would like to delay, to delay or um, for global climate change um, policies to not include provisions for liability or compensation. So as mentioned in the previous slides, um, we are already certain of the costs, of the major costs of climate change, and yet nothing is being done to hold them to account. Unfortunately, the Paris Agreement, um, however groundbreaking as it was for um, the climate change, the international climate change regime, it includes this one paragraph in the accompanying decision text, and it says that states agree by signing it that Article 8, which is this entire article about loss and damage, um, the effects of climate change that cannot be any more pre be prepared for um, does not involve or provide a basis for any liability or compensation. But later, I'll be showing um, a case in the Philippines, uh, in, our, in our country, where um, a government agency actually took the initiative to find that after all, um, after all of this obfuscation and this posturing, fossil fuel in, the fossil fuel industry can still be held liable. So, um, given all that we know now that climate change is a story of climate injustice, why, why do we need to approach it with the fame, with the framework of justice? So, um, while doing research for this presentation, I found this article um, written by the folks over at World Resources Institute that um, I think succinctly captures what, it, what we mean when we say um, we want to approach the climate change issue using the framework of justice. So they say that historically, the world has talked about climate change primarily as an environmental issue. They focus on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, rising seas, climate temperatures, and other hard data. So while this narrative is important, it's missing a critical component, people. So climate change is, a, is our story. It's a story of you and me. And demanding climate justice is framing the climate narrative as one that is inherently political and ethical. And it's primarily because climate change has deep repercussions on human rights, health, conflict, migration and displacement, gender-based violence, and many more. Um, so what makes it a people issue? Um, there are, I think, um, we've already touched upon how, you know, the most vulnerable sectors are affected by it. But at its core, um, at its roots, what makes climate change a people issue? Um, I'll only go through three things. Health, gender-based violence, and human rights. So for health, there is this study that was um, produced by Greenpeace that found that not only um, that climate change poses environmental risks to marginalized populations, but that each stage of the coal life cycle, mining, transportation, washing, combustion, and disposing of post-combustion wastes negatively affects health. So they predict that, the World Health Organization predicts that to, by 2030, which is just you know 10 years from now, climate change will be causing an additional 250,000 deaths each year from various diseases. And burning coal is unfortunately one of our still, one, one of still our major sources of energy in the Philippines. It's still a leading cause of various health diseases. And um, air pollutants pro pro produced by coal combustion has been linked to serious damage to the human respiratory, cardiovascular, and nervous systems. So of course, it's not like um, the fossil fuel industry executives are the, one are the ones facing the music for these health impacts. 
um, the most, the poorest communities who live beside um, fossil fuel projects are unfortunately the ones getting sick. And um, as I'll tell you later in a in a later slide, um, unfortunately in the Philippines, fossil fuel companies have been known to dismiss their um, health problems as just you know mere coincidence or totally not the fault of coal plants and other fossil fuel projects, which is again an affront to um, the rights of the most marginalized communities in the country. So my second point is that climate change is a people issue because it enhances and exacerbates gender-based violence. So um, again, there's a lot of literature um, specifically highlighting the connection between climate change, climate impacts to um, gender rights, but for now I'll only go through two points. The first one is that um, because we live in a patriarchal society, um, social, social cultural norms still limit women from acquiring information and skills necessary to escape or avoid hazards. In some countries, actually, dress codes are still imposed on women, and that can restrict their ability, their mobility in times of disaster. So um, there are multiple cases in countries, not just the Philippines, but also in a lot in South Asia, where women are not allowed to learn how to swim and women are not allowed to learn to climb trees because it's considered a masculine activity. Um, and of course, when disasters strike, they don't have any way to survive. And of course, they, have they are responsible for small children, so they cannot swim or run. So that being said, that renders women disproportionately vulnerable to disasters and other negative effects of climate change. To anchor a bit more back into the in our country, though, um, when Typhoon Yolanda hit Tacloban and neighboring um, provinces, what was devastating was not only the aftermath, but also the fact that in evacuation centers, there was a spike in reported um, violence and abuse cases against women and children. So again, that puts women at a great disadvantage when confronting um, climate impacts such as typhoons. And my last point is human rights. So as I mentioned earlier, climate change is primarily caused by fossil fuel companies and that there is a study proving that only 90 private and state-run entities have caused 71% of historical emissions. So this study, um, this study became the basis of a case taken up by the Commission on Human Rights, um, I think two or three years ago. And finally, last December, which is a couple of months back, um, in Madrid, which is where the United Nations Conference on Climate Change happened last year, the Commission on Human Rights announced their key findings. And this included um, the fact that carbon majors, which is what we're calling the 90 private and state-run entities, can be held not only morally and legally liable, for the violation of human rights of people, but also they violate human rights because their conduct of business has criminal intent because it was proven that they deny the reality of climate change and they obstruct climate action. Um, this again was an effort led by Greenpeace in, accord, in cooperation with a lot of other climate change nonprofits and collectives all over the Philippines. And um, I'd like to go to this example. Um, I see that we have a participant from Bataan and from Poultry Bataan. And um, unfortunately, the story of Limay Bataan is a deep story of climate injustice because when a particular coal plant project started there, the community living beside the project faced threats, displacement, intimidation, and eventually a murder case. So as of last year, the Philippines is considered the most dangerous country for environmental and climate defenders, according to Global Witness. And unfortunately, um, Ate Gloria Capitan, who fought against the coal stockpile in her neighborhood, um, was one of the uh, collateral damage by um, increasing business interests in the area. So I'm not sure if you can hear the audio. Um, and someone from the Living Law Data Seeker, can you hear the audio? Sorry. Okay, let me just fix it. Okay, 
Okay, so um, Ate Gloria Capitan's story is a story of, is a, unfortunately a growing narrative of environmental defenders who are killed in favor of growing business interests of coal plants and fossil fuel projects still expanding in the age of the climate emergency. Um, this is a story documented by Global Witness also. And we'll stop at the two-minute mark. Sabihan lang po ako ni tatay ko na hindi muna, hindi muna si, ta, si nanay ko pwedeng humarap dyan dahil nga, ganun nga, parang may sabi nga nagbabanta sa buhay niya. Ilang araw din kami nagbantay. Wala rin naman. Na baril din si nanay ko. Sinasangkot ako na po yung niluluto na, niluluto. Narinig po ako ng potok. Tatlong potok. May pagpanay ko po. Sa lubo ko yung ninang ko, nakasama ni nanay ko sa taas. Pero pagpanay ko doon, sabi niya, si nanay mo na baril. Si Ate Gloria ay isang uh, grandmother na napaka mapagmahal sa apo. In fact, yun yung dahilan kung bakit siya nagpa siyang uh, lumaban doon sa coal stockpile. Kasi... Lagi niyang kinukwento na hindi na nawalan ng sakit ang kanyang mga apo. At sa paniniwala na uh, nanggagaling ito doon sa kanilang environment. At yung environment nila ay pinopollute ng mga alikabok na nanggagaling sa operasyon ng coal stockpile. So um, the video is available on YouTube and on um, the accounts of Global Witness and I think Coal Free Bataan. So if you want to learn more about the specific case, you can reach out to me or to the Living Laudatus team where I will send the links. Um, but my point is this only solidifies the fact that um, climate change is a people issue because it's a human rights issue. It does not only affect um, trees or polar bears or anything like that. It affects real people and unfortunately, people who are already marginalized by society, by poverty, marginalized by inequities in our different societies. Um, so what do we do now? Knowing all that we know about how to frame the climate change issue as a climate justice issue, um, what do we do now? How do we empower ourselves and empower our friends, colleagues, and family members to take up this cause and to um, fight not only for ambitious climate action from our governments, but also for genuine climate justice, which seeks accountability from historical contributors from fossil fuel industry and safeguards the rights of all people from all sectors of society. Um, I think that what we can do, for starters, is to reframe three dominant narratives right now. The first is the narrative of the fossil fuel industry. Um, I'm sure that everyone knows, everyone here knows that the fossil fuel industry is known not only to obfuscate um, the realities that were wrought by their practices, their, their business practices, but they're also known to greenwash renewable energy solutions. Um, and I think it's very important to see through all that positive spin and to lay, that, lay bare the truths of their harmful and exploitative practices. The second narrative that we have to reframe is that individual lifestyle changes alone can topple the climate crisis. It needs to be a decisive systemic shift. And while it's all in good to turn off your um, lights for an hour during Earth Hour or to shift to being vegan, um, what's important is we bring everyone along to, this, to climate solutions. And it needs to be a systemic, decisive, um, equitable shift to a renewable energy-powered world. Because when we say climate justice, we don't just mean shutting down the fossil fuel industry, shutting down all environmentally harmful practices, but also building a better world, building a socially just world that leaves no one behind. 
And the third dominant narrative right now that we have to refrain is that we are too small to make a difference. If anything, um, this webinar shows that there's a lot of growing interest in not only climate justice, but in the climate movement. And that once we join together and um, synchronize our actions to demand not only for climate action, but also for climate justice, then we're going to make a dent on this problem. And we're going to be able to bring about that systemic shift for a better world for everyone. Um, myself and the folks over at my organization, 350.org, believe that our number one contribution to this movement is that we build people power. Um, my role as organizer means that I get to meet a lot of wonderful young people who are bringing about solutions in their own communities and in their own capacities. And we do a lot of trainings, we do a lot of um, coordination calls to make sure that we support each other in our initiatives. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, climate change is about power. But it's not about the power of the fossil fuel industry that continues to wield over us, but the people power that we can build if we all um, join together and fight this issue. So here's another video. Our fight against climate change is a battle over power. But not only the kind of power that runs our cars or keeps our buildings warm. We need to take back the power that the fossil fuel industry has over society. Fossil fuel companies are the wealthiest and most powerful corporations on the planet, and their core business model threatens all of us. For decades, they have corrupted our governments, ravaged our planet, and treated the atmosphere like an open sewer, while the impacts of climate change devastate the people who have done the least to cause the problem. We believe in a sustainable and prosperous future, which is socially just and economically fair. Our mission is to inspire, train and mobilise people to bring power back to citizens and create a thriving global movement. To put the heat on the fossil fuel industry, drive our leaders to act and create the climate solutions the world needs. We will confront the power of the fossil fuel industry, dismantling their social license and stopping their projects on the ground. We will also continue to work locally with communities affected, supporting those responding to climate disasters and working to promote investment towards community-based sustainable initiatives and renewable energy projects. We will keep targeting and pressuring local and national governments to take action on reducing emissions. But we need everybody. No matter where you live, there are ways to plug in. Whether it's joining our campaigns online, organising for climate action in your community, or joining a mass mobilisation to move beyond fossil fuels and to a clean energy future. There's room for everyone in this growing movement. Together, we can create a new kind of power. Join us. And I'd like to end with this slide. Um, while I was preparing for this presentation, I asked um, the Living Low Data team um, what they think um, are the guide questions that I should think of when I'm preparing these slides. And one of the questions that one of them asked me is that, what is the youth's role in all of this, in all these not only in all these mobilizations, but in the growing climate movement as well? Um, and I think it's simply this. Youth um, will become the future leaders, and it's only right that they, they, that they take ownership and leadership of the solutions as well. And last year, during the September climate strikes, we saw how much the youth want a climate just and a climate and a socially just world through the climate strikes. And I'd like to end um, with this video that captures all of the efforts that were um, that were inspired by just one lone striker. Um, and it's inspired a uh, wave of actions worldwide.
world in which my future is being stolen from me. We're here to write a new story, a story in which our country is doing everything in its power to address not only the climate crisis, but the systemic injustices at its roots. Планета в небезпеці. Ми хочемо зупинити видобуток одного палива. Ми хочемо, щоб Україна перейшла на відновні джерела енергії. І ми хочемо це зараз. So yes, um, if anything, I would like to close with this, um, is that confronting climate change with a climate justice lens means also addressing the systematic inequalities that um, made climate change possible and reinforces climate change um, in the first place. And that to build a better world, we not only have to fight for climate justice, but for social justice as well. So thank you so much. And um, I'll pass it over back to Wink. Thank you so much, Ms. Beatrice. So just a little recap for our audience. So Ms. Beatrice talked about how the climate crisis isn't just a crisis, but it's also an issue of injustice, which is why we are fighting for climate justice. Then we, she talked also about the major, the carbon majors in the Philippines and how they are supposed to be held accountable. Because as of now, they are benefiting from the suffering of the communities, of the local communities, our fellow Filipinos. And we are also going to be, and she also talked about how um, us as people who are in, in this webinar and also other um, nonprofit organizations that are fighting for climate change have to band together and to really find that power, that people power to uh, to shift, to create a paradigm shift and to create a better world for everyone in society, especially here in the Philippines. And so um, just a little reminder, we will be having a Q&A session afterwards. So all of your questions, you may post it in the Q&A tab at the bottom and we will be addressing them during the open forum. And now, oh, and also there was a question about if we're going to be sharing the presentation of Miss Beatrice and we will be posting the entire recording of the video on our Facebook page at Living Laudato Si PH. So moving on to our next speaker. So we have Brother Tagoy Hakosalem from the OAR and he is an ecological artist. He's a human rights activist and a religious brother of the Order of Agustinian Recollects, Recoletos. Brother Tagoy, from the o Brother Tagoy OAR, has co-founded Pusyon Kinaiyahan in Cebu in 2016, now an international grassroots movement to empower communities, to protect people and planet. He also received the Green Ring Award from, the Al, from Al Gore during the Climate Reality Leadership Course training in Pasay City on March 2016. He also received the Father Neri Sator Environmental Heroism Award in 2012 for his contributions in indigenous architecture and engineering. Brother Tagoy is currently based with the, Recolet, with the Recoletos in Madrid. Through his religious congregation's social action arm, Arcores, Red Solidaria Internacional Agustino Recoleta, 
So tonight he will be talking about the Catholic Church's position in the battle for climate justice. So Brother Tagoy, I pass it over to you. Hello, Co Brother. Hello. Hello, good evening. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'll just share my screen. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Good evening to all of us. Allow me to share with you an, a reflection and experience of climate justice campaigns and also provide to provide you also with a uh, reflection on climate justice and the COVID crisis. Our first question related to the uh, presentation of Beatrice, how government and corporation contribute to the climate crisis. Just a recap also. It's the 1% destroying the 99%. The 1%, the corporations, the big polluters versus the planet and people. And this 1% can include our government for allowing these corporations, these big polluters to destroy our planet and people. And our framework should be planet and people over profit. Government is now co-opting with corporations and we have to put the burden to them of responsibly destroying our common earth, our planet. And this is a, a recent case study, the mining in Humunhon, granted in PSA for last May 18, 2016, until October 22, 20, 2034 to mine 1,500 hectares in that small island in Samar. And the, the approval was granted last March 31, 2020. And we questioned this one with all the strong environmental laws that we have, and even with the, with the lockdown, why they're allowed to continue mining in that small island. The 99% we are the ones suffering from the, uh, from the capitalists and even from our government in action of destroying the planet and people. Our participation, our voices can make a difference by holding these big polluters accountable. And related to my assignment with the topic, uh, the role of the church. What is the Catholic church position in the battle for climate justice, at least in the Philippines. The church already declared a climate emergency, and we have the, the Bishop's Conference of the Philippines pastoral statement entitled, An Urgent Call for, Environ for Ecological Conversion, Hope in the Face of Climate Emergency, released last July 16, 2019. And the bishop said, we must activate climate action on behalf of the voiceless people and the planet. The investment campaign of the Philippine Church, the performance and challenges. The investment is the effective way to end the business of big polluters. The church is calling for the investment and we call for the investment because business or investment should not destroy the environment, should not enrich the war or arms economy, should not thrive on destroying the health of humanity, and must end the fossil fuel industry, and must end the coal madness. We need also to help the church on this divestment campaign. We have existing documents, Laudato Si and other church documents. In the Philippines, we have the CBCP pastoral statements, 
and we have also local church or diocese and pastoral direction and there are ecological pastoral directions with documents we need also to provide platform what is really divestment simply divestment is switching bank accounts to a provider which does not invest in fossil fuels most countries have institutions that don't divest in fossil fuels and don't invest in fossil fuels and offer current accounts, savings and loan accounts to divest. And we have to identify green banks. In Europe, the uh, non-government organizations, they are creating a green bank for divestment. We can help the church, dioceses and even religious congregations. And then, with the documents, with the framework of the church, we need clear directives on ethical economy. And hopefully with, the, with, the, with Pope Francis on our side, there will be revision on, in canon law. And with that, these directives can be integrated. And diocesan law, can, there can be adaptations also in our many diocesan laws. In the words of Pope Francis, there needs to be a distinctive way of looking at things, a way of thinking, policies, an educational program, a lifestyle, and a spirituality, which together generate resistance to the assault of the technocratic paradigm, from Laudato Si number 200, 111. And our sustainability framework in investment, we are always business centered, but with divestment, it should be ethically responsible, morally responsible towards the attainment of the quality of life. And then allow me also to share with you the monastic model of sustainability. There is a common farm the practice of ethical consumption in the monastery, the, the harvest, and they share the harvest, especially to the poor. And in the rule of St. Augustine, it is very clear, we should have what is only necessary and essential, not beyond our necessities. And there should be limits of acquisition and also a sense of justice. This is the monastic model of sustainability to uh, assist us in our divestment campaign. But there, there needs to be a transition because many of our dioceses, congregations are into investment. The need from, from system to practice. In the system, we have the leadership and the fund managers. We have to let them know what is the position of the church. We have to dialogue with them and be able to make them embrace this divestment campaign. And the pra praxis, the practices already existing among dioceses, among religious congregations, and even among schools and universities. The eco-pastoral direction, and now dioceses schools are into uh, solar energy transition, and even convents now are adapting on this, our parishes also. And then the need to have parish ecological actions. Already they are doing this one. The system and practice must be together. Our assessment, you know, in the words of Cardinal Turkson of the Dicastery of Human Development in Rome, he said, many churches globally are not responding to the call of Laudato Si. Climate change issue is not among the many priorities of other uh, dioceses or other bishops conferences all over the globe. But the Philippine church is the most active. Religious congregations in the Philippines are doing better. This is the whole sketch of our discussion. We need to initiate investment, divestment. We need to initiate divestment 
in the words of Pope Francis, for we would be striving intelligently, boldly, and responsibly to promote a sustainable and equitable development within the context of a broader concept of quality of life. Bishop uh, Alminasa and with other organ uh, environmental organizations participating in the campaign for divestment. The fourth question, as development and industrialization are usually linked to destruction, what is the church idea, view of development or industrialization? So we cannot fail to consider the effects on people's lives of environmental deterioration, current models of development and the throwaway culture, in the words of Pope Francis. The 99% must do protest actions, speaking against mining, the building of coal plants, the massive reclamation projects, deforestation, the pollution, the polluting, the pollution on the oceans and rivers and other environmental issues. And this is also relevant, the economic ecology of Pope Francis, the economy of stewardship, economy of solidarity, economy of sustainability, and the economy based on social justice to address all this environmental destruction created and made by companies and industries. The fifth question, what are the notable present church efforts on climate justice? How should it inspire every person? Climate justice campaign started long time ago and we should trace the historical roots and allow us to provide the, to be able us to provide the continuity of the current campaigns. No? We have the historical bishops, priests, religious and lay leaders campaigning for the rights of indigenous people and protection of nature long ago. And now the post Laudato Si period, we are doing partnerships now, networks of church people and environmental organizations fighting for climate justice and linking climate injustice to social injustice. In the, we are celebrating this uh, month, the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si document of Pope Francis. And after that document was released, this organization, church and NGOs already started campaigning for the integral ecology direction of Pope Francis. We have the global Catholic climate movement, also helped by the Archdiocese of Manila. We have many dioceses and offices. We have the Federation of Asian Bishops Conference, the Association of Major Religious Superiors in the Philippines, the ECOHIM, and then the NASA Caritas from the side of the church. And organizations also, we have the Climate Reality Project, Greenpeace, Poshan Kinayahan, 350.org, and many other environmental organizations together campaigning for climate justice. And we started the campaign from the side of the Philippines. We started the campaign of uh, having 850,000 signatures. You know, we achieved these signatures, and so this is to support the call of Pope Francis on integral ecology and deliver the signature signatures to the 2015 Paris Climate Summit for the global call for climate justice. We can see Yeb presenting the signature to the president then of, then of France. And we achieved the following, no? Many supported by many environmental and charged organizations. The non-approval of the coal power plant in Cebu City, the moratorium of coal plant in Negros Occidental, the anti-coal mobilization in Batangas, the biggest so far, and the end of quarrying in Naga Cebu. Church people, communities fighting for climate justice. Uh, we have here Brother Simon leading the community in Sawang Calero in Cebu. And then we have Archbishop Palma signing the uh, 
signing our campaign and supporting the campaign for Break Free Against Coal. And then we have Bishops, Bishop Jerry Alminasa with the youth for the end, uh, for the fighting for the non-approval of the construction of coal plant in San Carlos City, Negros Occidental, and in other areas in Negros. And then we have also Archbishop Argilias in Batangas leading the campaign, break free from fossil fuels. And then in Batangas also a simple parish priest, Warren Puno, leading local and national campaign against coal. There are some people bound to religion. Should religious beliefs limit one's participation in working for the betterment of the environment and humanity? The answer is no, because all beliefs are rooted on care for nature and people. Everything is interconnected as, as Pope Francis said. And in Islam, they have the saying, the earth is green and beautiful, and Allah has appointed you as stewards over it. The whole earth has been created a place of worship pure and clean. In Buddhism, it is our responsibility as Buddhists and as human beings to respond to an unfolding human-made climate emergency that threatens life. In Judaism, we know all earth needs not only the joyful human voice, but also the healing human hand. And Pope Francis said, the majority of people living on our planet profess to be believers. This is for religions to dialogue among themselves for the sake of protecting nature, defending the poor, and building networks of respect and fraternity. The efforts of little churches. No? Little churches are working on the ground to achieve the ecological dream of the church. The climate pilgrims, they have walked already from Rome to Paris and from Rome to Poland. Young people from the Philippines and other countries walking for the sake of saving and protecting our climate and our people. The Lumads fighting, fighting for the destruction of their identity and ancestral land. And now we have NASA CBCP network doing eco convergence among dioceses, parishes, and organizations all over the country. And we have the Living Laudato Si Philippines, the host of this uh, webinar, and doing many actions also for the environment. And leading the way, the Diocese of San Carlos, among many dioceses, campaigning for anti-coal divestment and all other environmental campaigns. Young people have a new ecological sensitivity and a general spirit. Some of them are making admirable efforts to protect the environment, said Pope Francis. Now our reflection, the climate injustice and the COVID crisis. Pope Francis said, the earth does not forgive. If we have despoiled the earth, its response will be very ugly. We are seeing the death of the earth the fires in the Amazons, in Australia and other parts of the world, the pollution of our from our industries and organizations campaigning for the protection of our nature, of our planet. And we are seeing now our deaths. The pandemic of the coronavirus reveals to us the way we live in our common home, the earth. We are destroying the mother earth rapidly. The lesson it can convey to us is, it is imperative to reform our way of living on it as a living planet. She is warning us the way we are behaving, we can continue this mess. Otherwise, the earth itself will take revenge on us, overly aggressive and evil to the system of life of our own making. We are seeing from hospitals to graveyards, burying our dead, our heroes, no? we bury them with pain. And now we have the climate emergency equally also health emergency, climate and health emergency. This epoch we are facing the climate crisis. Unless we stop abusing our planet, we'll be dying slowly. And this year, 
the global health crisis, killing us rapidly and deadlier. Where can we get healing? Where can we avail of recovery? Our environment is helping us recover. Our environment is sustaining us in this crisis. Our environment is telling us to protect it for us to be able to live. And where are we failing? Failure of governance, failure of priorities. All nations, no, they fail to provide all this. No? And people's health first, the health of nature first. We are seeing this and we need to, after this crisis, we need to recover. No? And we are turning our cities into graveyards. This is the site of the climate change conference in Madrid last December. Rodney, Bea, and myself were there. No? And now they have turned this one into hospitals and graveyards. We don't have enough masks, but more than enough bullets, no? said Cardinal Tagle. We are creating more diseases like disease of xenophobia, disease of insensitivity, and disease of stubbornness among our leaders and among ourselves. But there is hope. We are see seeing hope. People are showing generosity. People are mobilizing concrete responses. People are caring. And in this COVID crisis, we need the antibodies of justice, charity, and solidarity from the words of St. Francis, of Pope Francis. As the tragic coronavirus pandemic has taught us, we can overcome global challenges only by showing solidarity with one another and embracing the most vulnerable in our midst. Thank you and thank you, Brother Armin. Thank you, Bea. Thank you, Radni. Thank you, Living Lauda to see. And thank you to the people who are with us in this, not only in this webinar, but in this climate strike, but in this climate gathering, speaking for climate justice, speaking for nature and people. Daghang salamat. Thank you so much, Brother Tagoy. Um, it's very interesting to have the point of view from within the church because I'm betting that most of us um, well, especially me, I don't have much insight to exactly the the system of the whole church. And it's very enlightening to hear from you about how this dates all the way back from before we are, from before now where we're talking about climate emergency and lo the Laudato Si. So it's really interesting. And also, it's really important that we also showcase the good sides, the strides that the church has been taking um, towards positive impact on the environment. And now, thank you so much, Brother Tagoy. And now before the Q&A, we here at Living Laudato Si Philippines will be showing you a quick video on tips for your ECQ based on the Laudato Si. Sumayin nyo ang kapayapaan. Hashtag Buhay Laudato Si. Sa panahon ng COVID-19 pandemic, ang maging isang responsabling mamamayan para sa kalikasan ay napakahalaga. Tandaan natin na ang kapaligiran ay hindi lamang ang inang kalikasan kundi ang mga kapwa nating nakapaloob dito. Sa inspirasyon ng Laudato Si, Bilang 211 ni Paul Francis, narito ang ilang mga kapakipakinabang na maari nating gawin sa panahon ng krisis na ito. Una, panatiling malusog ang pangangatawan. Kumain ng tamang pagkain at uminom ng maraming likido o tubig at kinakailangang vitamina. Huwag kalimutang mag ehersisyo Pangalawa, alagaan ang kalusugan ng iyong kaisipan. Iwasan ang sobrang pagdamdam at pag-iisip ng mga kwento at balita tungkol sa pandemic, kabilang dyan ang social media. Maaari mo rin gawin ang mga bagay na nakapaglilibang sa iyo na hindi nakapagdudulot ng stress at pagkabalisa. 
Pangatlo, panatilihing malinis at ligtas ang iyong sarili. Huwag kalimutan maligo. Uh, panatilihin ang personal hygiene at ugaliing maglinis ng bakuran at ng inyong tahanan. Isegregate ang mga basura at i-compost ang mga nabubulok. Pangapat, turuan ang iyong sarili at ang iba pa tungkol sa COVID-19 pandemic. Alamin ang pinakabagong mga balita at makinig sa payo ng mga profesional at ng mga eksperto. Iwasan ang pagbabahagi ng fake news and information kahit ano paman ang mangyari. Panlima, maging isang responsableng mamimili. Kung pupunta sa palengke at bibili sa grocery, iwasan ang single-use plastics and paper. Iwasan din ang pag-aaksaya ng pagkain, tubig at iba pang mga gamit sa oras at pagkatapos ng community quarantine. Patayin ang ilaw kung hindi naman kinakailangan at bawasan ang paggamit ng kuryente. Panganim, alamin at mag-aral ng mga bagong kasanayan o skills. Maaari mong subukan ang pagtanim at pagpalago ng iyong sariling pagkain tulad ng gulay sa iyong bakuran. Magluto ng mas malusog na pagkain o mag-aral kung papaano pangalagaan o ikumpuni ang ating mga appliances. Malay mo, mayroon ka palang tinatagong talento na dapat mong tuklasin. Pampito, makipag-usap at gumawa ng mga aktibidad na makapagpapalakas ng inyong pagkakaisa at pagmamahalan ng pamilya sa loob ng tahanan. Of course, ang physical distancing ay dapat isa alang alang Pangwalo, huwag kalimutan ng ating mga kapatid na mas nangangailangan upang sila ay makasurvive araw-araw. Ang ating mga frontliners, ang mga nawala ng hanap buhay, at ang mga walang makain. Magbahagi ng mga blessings. Mag-donate online o sa mga lihitimong mga organisasyon. Pangsyam, Sundin at igalang ang mga panuntunan at mga bilin ng mga otoridad upang mapigilan ang malawakang paglaganap ng virus. Huwag mahiyang magtanong kung hindi malinaw ang mga patakaran. At huwag kalimutang edokumento at i-report kung may paglabag sa mga karapatang pangtao. At pang sampu, manalangin. Ipanalangin matapos na ang dilubyong ito. Tuloy-tuloy na panalangin. Idalangin natin ang mga frontliners at ang mga naapektuhan ng COVID-19 at ang kanilang mga pamilya. Alam natin na hindi tayo pababayaan ng puong may kapal. Ito ang sabi ni Pope Francis. Gayun man ang edukasyong ito na naglalayong lumikha ng pang-ekolohiyang pagkamamamayan, paminsan-minsan ay limitado sa pagbibigay ng impormasyon at nakakaligtaang makapaghasik ng magandang kaugalian. Ang pag-iral ng mga batas at patakaran ay hindi sapat sa katagalan upang supilin ang masamang pag-uugali kahit na naruroon ang epektibong paraan ng pagpapatupad. Kung magdadala ang mga batas na ito ng makabuluhan at pangmatagalang epekto, dapat na nakararami ng mga kasapi ng lipunan ay maudyok silang sapat na matanggap ito at magkaroon ng personal na pagbabago upang makatugon. Tanging sa paglinang ng mahusay na pagkamatuwid na makakaya ng mga tao na mag-alay ng walang pag-iimbot na panatang ekolohikal. May pagkamarangal ang tungkulin sa pangangalaga ng sambilika sa pamamagitan ng maliliit na pagkilos araw-araw at kahangahanga kung paanong nagdala ng totoong pagbabago sa paraan ng pamumuhay. Hashtag Buhay Laudato Si. Buhay Laudato Si. There we have it. I hope that you have learn something from the Buhay Laudato Si ECQ tips this evening. All right, so I think we'll begin first with the Q&A while we are fixing the technical issue. Okay, so I'm here now in the Q&A tab. And we have a few similar questions here. 
Hello, good evening, panelists. Good evening, speakers. Are you there? Yes. Brother Tagoy. Hello. Hi, hi, hi. I'm here. Hello. Good evening. Okay, good evening. so we will start with the Q&A portion for now. And there is a common question here. And it's asking about the government practices, the government initiatives of the government to address environmental issues. So this is asked by Sheena Camille, Jesse Riveral, and also why is it that coal industries are still allowed? So what are the initiatives of the government and why are coal industries still allowed? So this question can be answered by any one of you So it can be what are the initiatives of the local government, the Philippine government that you know of that address the environmental issues and while, why coal industries are still allowed, especially in the Philippines, if it is a real contributor of greenhouse gases? And if you know of alternatives, I think that's a major question here. Like what are the alternatives? Because we keep on asking about, we keep on, uh, telling people about how coal is bad for the communities, but a lot of them also are wondering what is the alternative. And I think that we could answer their questions because of how we understand that um, right now the renewable energy is enhanced. So if you could provide more insight to that. Miss Beatrice. Thank you. Um, sure. Um, I think um, the reason why we're still dependent on coal energy and fossil fuels, not just in the Philippines, but in the world, is that they're considered cheap. And of course, we're a developing country. But the thing is, it's only cheap. It only has that low price tag because it does not reflect externalities. The costs of um, I was saying the health costs, the human rights costs, and all the costs that are detrimental to the communities living beside them. Another argument that I also found myself struggling with whenever people ask me about this is that um, um, why is it that coal energy is still favored by, um, by a country even though they, they believe that climate change is real. And we know for a fact that our government um, considers climate change to be a priority. We have a climate change commission, and I'm seeing some members of the CCC here, um, and that we have one of the world's, I would, I would argue, one of the more comprehensive environmental laws. Um, the frequent argument used for this is that the Philippines is still emitting less than 1%. And of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And they think that gives us the room to emit more because we don't emit as much as other countries have had so far in the past. But to that, I will respond that um, I think I've made this point a couple of times in my presentation, but emitting um, greenhouse gas emissions is not only the subject matter at hand, it's also how communities are affected by fossil fuel industry and um, the practices of the fossil fuel industry. So I don't think um, any community is worth sacrificing for profit. Um, it's not like it's the fossil fuel executives who are living beside their own projects who are dealing with the health issues and the human rights violations. Um, we have to remember that the cost of, or sorry, the, we have to remember that carbon dioxide emissions are not the only measurement by which we can um, understand genuine climate justice, but also if uh, marginalized and vulnerable communities are still affected. So yeah, that would be my answer. And of course, renewable energy, um, the price is the, it's the great alternative to this, even though, the, even though um, some people say that it's still very expensive. Um, there are multiple projections um, and multiple case studies confirming that the price is slowly becoming competitive with cheap coal energy. And um, we just have to make it known um, and advocate for more renewable energy in the mix of um, our country and also in other countries because, of course, our climate efforts don't happen in isolation. 
So yeah, and I think, sorry, yeah, I think I'm gonna answer one of the questions that was asked uh, on the Q&A tab about the documentary about how um, renewable energy is not green um, as proven by this documentary um, that was screened last Earth Day. Um, one of the arguments of that documentary was um, solar panels. Beatrice, yeah, what's sorry. the title for our audience of the documentary? Yeah, it's Planet of the Humans by yes. Michael Moore. Yeah, sorry, someone asked about it in the Q&A tab. And I think it's in relation to the previous question because um, some people would argue that the production of solar panels is not green, it's not clean. And of course, it's not going to be perfect, right? Solar panels are not made of rainbows and tears. They're made of, um, they're constructed in a fossil fuel industry run world. And of course, it's not, no solution is going to be perfect at first. And that's why we have to transition. And I'm also sharing a link to in the chat um, containing like some arguments um, some counter arguments against the criticisms against the use of renewable energy in that documentary. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beatrice. So, Ms. Beatrice just shared a link in our Zoom webinar chat. You can check that out. And then a question for Brother Tagoy and Brother Armin. So, good evening. What are the merits? This is from Daniel Rotilia. What are the merits of sustained, constant interfaith dialogue and statements of unity on climate action, especially in the Philippines? So, it's asking about the merits of interfaith dialogue. So, Brother Tagoy, would you like to answer? Thank you. Uh, Paul Francis with the with the encyclical Laudato Si, in making this encyclical, he tapped scientists and even experts of other, from other religions to be able to construct this very relevant uh, document on, not only on ecology, but on social justice. And he was helped by the experts from other religions. And also, we have to understand that the climate crisis it does not recognize on what religion you belong. No, this is a problem. All people are being affected of this crisis, and then all people must act any faith, any religion, and that's why Laudato itself is a unifying document, wherein individuals, leaders from different religions, even non-believers, no gathered together to be able to address this climate injustice. And uh, in the Philippines, I think with uh, Sir Radni of Living Laudato Si, they were able to organize a massive interfaith conference on climate emergency. And I think Radni himself can share about the output of this one. But I guess all of us are affected. We need to act. We need to respond. You know, in uh, no identified uh, faith, but as an individual, as a person being affected. Because we have to care for what God has created, us as a people, and nature also. Yes, Brother Tagoy, uh, this is Rodney. And yes, you are right that we gathered, actually, uh, interfaith leaders last November. And... Uh, of course, we're saddened by the, the death of Senator Harrison Alvarez. He actually pioneered in uh, gathering interfaith uh, communities uh, to address uh, the climate crisis. But last year, uh, many, uh, at least uh, 14 uh, faith community leaders gathered to declare that indeed there's climate emergency and that they called for an urgent uh, reduction of the use of fossil fuels in the country, especially coal and the rapid development of cleaner renewable energy. And we also would like to emphasize that uh, for the civil society organizations and of course for the government, as we've heard, Secretary Mani also was, uh, the Climate Change Commission was there uh, last year during the interfaith community gathering. Uh, we also highlight a just and fair transition from uh, uh, coal-fired power-based um, uh, industries, uh, energy, and uh, some uh, fossil fuels 
that we also, in hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, we need also to hear and listen to the cry of our workers who are working in the fossil fuel industry. So what we wish is for the government also to uh, actually institu institutionalize uh, um, strategies on how to do a just and fair transition. As we all know that well, majority of our coal, uh, if not from Semerara uh, in Antique, we actually import a lot of coal. And we're not only talking, if we talk about uh, coal-fired power plant, we're not only talking about um, um, the usage, utilization of coal in our power plants, but also from the very source of coal, wherein we cut trees, we uh, actually dig and move mountains, we um, transport them from uh, other countries, and the communities are affected there, by the way, affected in where in where we uh, get our, our uh, coal to be used in the Philippines. So it should be um, the whole cycle that we need to look at, not only utilization of coal in power plants, but also the source of it. The transportation, transporting uh, coal from other countries, that means a lot of greenhouse gases as well. And uh, uh, from uh, extraction, to development, to utilization, and to the waste, uh, and also the utilization of water in the... Uh, operation of coal-fired power plants. We have alternatives, uh, which uh, indigenous indigenous uh, sources of uh, energy in the country, no need to import. We have, uh, we have geothermal, we have uh, water, we have hydropower, we have wind, we have solar. So these are the sources of energy that are really indigenous to us. We, we don't need to, to import them. And uh, I, I think uh, one of the questions also, how about nuclear power? Uh, nuclear power um, for us, we live in the Philippines, of course we believe in, um, we believe uh, actually in the principle of uh, um, sustainable development. If uh, uh, communities will be affected, if you're not sure uh, that this is safe, then we need really to assess. And of course, uh, if, uh, community would accept that there will be such, then uh, we need also to respect the communities around uh, uh, in, the, in the surrounding areas. And uh, because we have already our indigenous source here, why not uh, maximize our indigenous and native source of energy? And, and actually in uh, nuclear power, we need to mine again uranium, which is uh, one of the elements and to be used for nuclear uh, power. This uh, issue, this uh, uh, a source of energy may need to be uh, uh, actually studied, uh, but for us, what we have is what we can maximize and capitalize. Yes? Uh, we can. Yes, hello. I think, okay, then... So we will also be posting um, details about our interfaith dialogue on Laudatisi. Thank you so much, Brother Tagoy, also for answering the question. And now next, there are a lot of people in the webinar here who want to make, to, who want to contribute also to helping out in the climate justice movement. And so some of them are asking, how do we get resources for, how do we find resources that will support community organizing and social enterprises? So this is from Miss Karen She, she, I'm so sorry. Yes, so how do they find these resources? If, for example, they want to start their own organized, their own organization within their community, So, I think, sir, yes. Yes, I think Baya and uh, Brother Tagoy would be able to share something about uh, uh, their resources and also 350.org. Uh, they have a lot of resources and campaign materials. Brother Tagoy, perhaps, and Baya. In the Philippines, we have the Foundation for Philippine Environment, no? FPE. And FPE, they have a schedule for presentation of projects, proposals. And you can, they have a website, you can con connect with them. That's in the Philippines. But now we have the web as our platform to be able to search for uh, support 
for our campaigns. But what is important is really that we are doing actions. No? That's the important thing. It's not only uh, accessing funds, but really doing action for the sake of the planet, for the sake of the environment, and for the sake of the community. And in that case, you have something that uh, we need a credible reality to be able to be helped. No? And that can be achieved by engaging and even by planning and even by really involving people, not only the, the organizers or the organization, but the whole, the community, the organization, and being able to present a clear a project, a clear program. But in our experience, working on the ground, the credible reality is the best uh, proposal that you can do. Again, there are many environmental or organizations and even in the framework of sustainable development goals. You need to target like the issue on environment. There are many, there are many uh, from the 17 goals, think of projects related to a specific goal, like in this case in environmental programs, like climate action, life underwater, and all these things. No? You can be able to uh, connect with that and be able to present a clear project. Thank you. Uh, yes, for 350.org, we have um, this link. I'll send it in the chat. It's trainings.350.org. Basically, we have online skill ops, online programs on the basics of organizing, introduction to campaigning, um, even climate change science 101. So um, these are mostly um, to share knowledge that we have called over, our, our, I think, 11 years now of experience. Because 350 strength, I would say, is really organizing and building movements. Um, some organizations lead on policy advocacy, some organizations lead on campaigns, but I would say that our strength, especially our 350 Asia team, is really um, linking to movements that are working in the grassroots and linking them to each other more importantly. Um, in that website, you'll see some essential videos and some um, storytelling labs, like um, real case studies on how people from other regions are doing it. We're working very hard with adding more Asia content but um, that's something that we're really excited about. And I think um, just keep checking back. Well, we'll eventually have them on the site. As for like organizing help and um, tips, um, I'm attaching another link. It's, called, it's from the 350 website as well. Um, it's, the link says starting a local 350 group. But of course, um, we don't really care that much about brand affiliation or naming rights or anything like that, it's still a basic guide to organizing. Um, you can um, expect and you can ask for help from our team um, to like um, give you insights into our experience and to see um, how we can help you in your respective contexts. One thing that um, I would say though is that in Asia, 350.org has only two country offices. So we have an office in Indonesia and in Japan. But in the Philippines, we have a volunteers collective. They're not an official um, 350 office, but they're made up of the most wonderful like, um, and enthusiastic volunteers from different backgrounds who are working on local campaigns. Um, mostly they help with the climate strikes, they help with storytelling, they help with producing videos and art and um, many other activities. So yeah, if you want to check that out, um, you can check the links and I can also, um, maybe you can get my contact information from the organizers of this webinar if you need more info. Thanks. Yeah, we can, uh, I think we can also share what we have uh, with the Living Laudato Si Philippines. Uh, the Living Laudato Si Philippines has uh, other two uh, programs in which we can collaborate and we can, in which we can share uh, our resources as well, like materials and even going to your places and helping you out on how to implement these uh, programs. Uh, the first that we have is actually uh, the LS, uh, hashtag LS211. Uh, these are little things that you can do on top of actually um, engaging the uh, companies, etc. cetera. Uh, we have this LS211 uh, uh, based on uh, the uh, based on the um, 
encyclical of Pope Francis living uh, Laudato Si on Care for a Common Home, number 211. These are uh, the nine doable and effective ways on how to show our love and care uh, to our common home. And uh, uh, these are just nine. First is avoiding the use of plastic and paper, reducing water consumption, uh, separating refuse, cooking only what can reasonably be consumed, showing care for other living beings, using public transport or carpooling after the ECQ, of course, uh, uh, planting trees, uh, turning off unnecessary lights, and reusing something. These are the nine uh, doable uh, uh, things, uh, small acts of love, according to Pope Francis. Second, we also will have a webinar on this uh, uh, on May 21. Uh, we'll be sharing this with you, this uh, framework, Laudato Si Schools, uh, in which you can you can uh, not only integrate Laudato Si in the curriculum, but in the whole uh, system of your school. Uh, in, that, in that case, you may ask yourself, how well would my school uh, or university or college be compliant you know, to uh, uh, Laudato Si? So there are uh, actually 10 uh, ways on how to do that. And uh, uh, through our webinar uh, on May 21, we'll share with us the best practices and the tips on how to do this. Yes, thank you. That's for uh, Laudato Si, Living Laudato Si Philippines. Thank you so much, Brother Tagoy, Sir Rodney, and Miss Beatrice for answering the question. So there you have it. We can have, we have opportunities for you, the attendees of this webinar, to join in the climate justice and to join in with our speakers for their own for their own movements. And so we have a new question from Kenley Monteagudo from the Climate Change Commission. And any of the presenters may answer this question. So right now during this COVID-19 pandemic, we've all experienced, we've all witnessed that the environment is improving, that there are positive impacts on the environment, especially with the reduction of air pollutants, less consumption of fossil fuels. So we're wondering if it is possible to maintain this improving state of the environment after the pandemic. So once the ECQs and the GCQs have all been, have all ended, so how do we maintain this improving state? So Ms. Beatrice or Brother Tagoy? Hello. <laughs> yeah, both of them. <laughs> okay, I'll go first if that's okay, brother. Okay. Um, yeah, the thing with um, the projections surrounding the lifting of the quarantine, not just in the Philippines, but also in other countries, is that there's going to be, like, unfortunately, a boom. Like, it's, no, it's going to surpass, like, normal pollution levels, but it's going to be way more than that. Um, it's almost as if we're compensating for the time we did not pollute. Um, the thing is, if we want to preserve that um, that reduction of pollution, not just in air pollution, but in emissions, we really have to um, put in place sustainable um, policies on, um, on air pollution and against um, more greenhouse gas emissions. And the only way to do that, of course, is to be more proactive in our measures. It's not gonna magically fix itself like it almost did during this time. Um, we can't rely, of course, on another um, global event such as a pandemic to do it for us. So I think um, if we really want to preserve like a reduction or even the eradication of pollution and emissions um, in the future, we really have to be as advocates and as activists, we have to fight for um, the systemic shifts, the policies that we need to put in place so that they don't um, spike up again. So, yeah. Brother the guy, sorry. <laughs> yes, today we are seeing the, we are seeing our environment as something to be cared, no? It's a, it's a reflection moment for us that with clean air, we can see the mountains in, in, for example, in Metro Manila with all these things, but these are only temporary. And there should be, uh, uh, from reflection, we need to, it's more of not, it's more of benefiting from our reflection 
of how we can do to protect creation, to protect the planet. Because in, in a month's time or, or a year, we go our usual way, no? With pollution and all these things. But allowing us to be able to reflect on through this crisis is for us to give us strength that we can do something to reduce pollution, to reduce or to stop uh, destroying our planet. But again, the, the sadness is we are in lockdown, but continuously environmental damages are being done. No? Like China continues to occupy our islands, our islets in Palawan or in, in uh, what, uh, West Philippine Sea. And mining operations are ongoing, not only in Homonon Island, but in other areas. These are things that we need to reflect and be able to act, that uh, allow us to have reflection, but people are still, uh, there are still vultures in our midst, no? taking advantage of, of the silence and of the lockdown. I think as activists, we need to act and we need to be able to gather again and even online no, to be able to uh, awaken people that we have to stop, we have to uh, again organize to protect nature and people. Yeah. Thank you, brother. We can um, just a little reflection as well on uh, what our uh, friends from the Climate Change Commission uh, uh, is pointing out. Uh, as we all know, this is the very for me. This is the very first time that I uh, experienced uh, such quarantine, like uh, staying within uh, the premises for two months, like only only um, uh, going out for for uh, like going to the market, to the palenque, and uh, uh, actually having uh, some uh, stuff delivered. But as we all know, we have SARS before, but no no kind of quarantine that we're experiencing right now. But it took 25 years, 25 years of talking, uh, the conferences of parties, uh, uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change from COP1 to COP25 last year in Madrid, uh, in, in Spain. Uh, Brother Tagoy showed uh, the area or the place, the venue where we went there for the 25th uh, conference of parties, the 25th uh, negotiation to solve the climate crisis. But after that, January, what we were unable to do to mitigate climate change and to mitigate like pollution, greenhouse gases, we were able to make it like for two months or for one month. It took a virus for us to realize that indeed we can actually reduce our greenhouse gases in one month, in two months. But if we'll be able to discipline ourselves, just how we discipline ourselves within the confines of our rooms and houses and to actually avoid uh, using um, uh, uh, fossil fuels or actually using transportation in the Philippines where the top carbon emitter would be transportation and, and energy, then I, we can actually do this thing. We can actually take action more drastic action when it comes to the problem of the climate crisis. The virus or COVID-19 would, uh, would go, uh, like we don't know, one year or two years, but the climate crisis is still waiting. And uh, this proves, uh, of course, that uh, we can actually do something and change our lifestyles. We have a lot of lessons to learn, but of course we're praying uh, for the souls of those who departed and we are one in solidarity with uh, those who, uh, and the families that uh, they left. And actually we need to help also the Climate Change Commission uh, because there are uh, agencies also that uh, they need to talk to and sometimes it's uh, quite difficult. And we, we will work, uh, continue to work strategically with the government and with the communities uh, to face this crisis and solve this crisis as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Rodney, Brother Tagoa, and Ms. Beatrice. Thank you so much for ask, answering the questions that were presented here tonight. 
And now we move on to the last portion of this webinar, which is our engagement and constituency officer, Ms. Sheena Katrina Orihuela, to present to you the next webinars in this series, as well as how to communicate with us at Living Laudato Si Philippines. Ms. Sheen, are you there? Hi, hi everyone. I am Sheen Orihuela, Engagement and Constitu Constituency Officer of Living Laudato Si Philippines. And uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us on our second webinar session. I'm just going to make it short. Um, we have a lot of activities in store with you. The first is we are celebrating this year's fifth anniversary of Pope Francis encyclical letter, Laudato Si, on care for a common home addressed to all people of goodwill. So it will happen on May 16 to May 24, 2020. Um, this encyclical has since been an influential document, not just for the religious world, but also for the secular world, inspiring different groups, movements, NGO, NGOs, civil societies. Um, next, please, Pope. Um, for this, um, for this year's theme is all about everything is interconnected. When we say when we say interconnected, we are all affected, and we must care for a common home. So, in response to the Laudato Si Week celebration, um, we have a lot of webinar session, upcoming webinar session. Um, on May sixteen, we will be having a topic about planetary health is human health at 7 p.m. May 18, 2020 at 7 p.m. Integral ecological conversion post-COVID-19 economic recovery. In part, this is in partnership with the Eco Jesuit. May 21, 2020 at 7 p.m. Learn, mo learn more about our Laudato Si, schools toward ecological citizenship. And lastly, our culminating activity, which is on May 24, 2020 at 7 p.m. Sustainable Development Goals and load and Laudato Si towards Eco Solidarity. So this um, Sustainable Development Goals is actually, and Laudato Si is created by our, my fellow colleague, um, Wing Ken Helito and um, Jan Dio Algo. And uh, please um, get in touch with us for more updates. Um, please follow us on Laudato C on our Facebook page, which is Living Laudato C, on our Twitter at Laudato CPH, our Instagram at loud, Laudato CPH, and you can also send us a message by email info at livinglaudatoc.org.ph and through our website www.livinglaudatoc.ph. And also, we will be launching our newsletter by the end of the month and hope that you can be part of us join us in caring for our common home. Thank you so much. And that's it for in my end. Thank you so much. Thank Nate. you, Sheen. Thank you, Sheen. And thank you so much to our guest speakers, our panelists, Ms. Beatrice and Brother Tagoy. Thank you so much for spending this night with us and for imparting your knowledge and experience. And most importantly, inspiring us and showing the possibilities that we can take. Thank you, everyone who joined this webinar and you may you may subscribe you may continue to uh, watch the subsequent sub, uh, webinars via our facebook page we will be launching a link to that and also we will be releasing digital certificates from this webinar and as well as releasing the webinar itself online and please answer the evaluation form so that we will know what to improve on to make sure that your experience with us with this webinar series will continue to improve and continue to inspire so thank you everyone sir Rodney Galicia do you have something to add and uh, uh, there are questions that were uh, we weren't able to uh, answer but rest assured that uh, if you contact us, we'll be more than happy to answer your queries and uh, uh, we'll try our best and we'll do our best to answer your uh, questions as well. And uh, as, as closing, I would like to 
thank uh, Bea, uh, one of our uh, climate activists, youth activists in the country, and Brother Tagoy, who is now in Madrid, actually. He is in Spain, based in Spain. And thank you, Brother, for uh, joining us. And everyone, thank you so much. And please uh, don't hesitate to contact us and uh, visit our social media or email us and visit our website. And uh, thank you, Winkin, for moderating, for facilitating this uh, uh, second webinar we have uh, for this uh, uh, ECQ uh, period. And uh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, please join us in praying for our, um, for our common home, praying for our fellow men and community in this time of COVID-19. COVID-19. kalusugan, nikapin mo rin ang mga kumakalina sa kanila. Pag kamitin mo ng kapayapaan ay hanggan ang mga kumanaw. Pagkaloob mo kami ng biyaya na Sumamo kami na iyong hinto ang paglaganap ng virus at ipagawa kami sa lahat ng mga tao. Pinihiling namin ito sa pamamagitan ng Diyos Kristo na marubuhay at magkahari kasama ng Espiritu Santo at isang Diyos magpasawalaan dyan. Amen. Maraming salamat po sa lahat at uh, isang mapagpalang gabi sa inyong lahat. Mabuhay po kayo.